How long have you been working as a member of provincial parliament? Uh, just about uh, about uh, 13 months since I've been uh, voted in as an, an MPP for the riding of Kiwetno. <coughs> That question was on behalf of my co-worker, Lady Miles. My next question on behalf of Braden Monacana is, what inspired you to become a member of the provincial parliament? I had no inspiration to become a politician, but it just kind of came to me. Um, but what really uh, interested me, intrigued me about my role is, uh, I did health for about 12 years and I understood the, you know, what, uh, how people are treated or how, how our people are treated within the healthcare system federally, provincially and how people fell through the cracks and I didn't uh, and people paid for those issues with their lives and with their health and uh, uh, being becoming a member of provincial parliament becoming a politician, uh, I had to ad address some of the um, issues that affect uh, whether it's, we call it social determinants of health. Social determinants of health can mean access to education, it can mean housing, access to clean water, access to, uh, you know, uh, food security, and it has an impact on health and I couldn't focus on um, just health only. There are other factors that come into play, and that's really that. That's a, that was really uh, what really intrigued me. What really made me made it make a decision to become a voice for the North. I'm curious about how, if you have any recommendations for how students can feel like they belong and have a sense of self worth. Like how the community can help <clears throat> students feel like that? I think uh, it's really important that we go back to our teachings as First Nations people, as Cree people, as Oji Cree people, uh, going back to the teachings, the history, um, and also the traditions of our people. Uh, going back to the land, going back to the language. Language uh, comes uh, from the land. That's who we are. Uh, without the land, who are we? We need to bring our identity back as First Nations people. We need to be able to speak our language uh, as First Nations people. And I, I think that's very critical. And not to be afraid to, of who you are, not to be um, you know, shy of who we are, not to be, uh, you know, we need to be First Nations people first before we can become and uh, and then also what we need to also learn the other system the formal education going to high school going to college going to university we have to uh, learn that as well and br never to forget who we are as as First Nations people. What were the biggest challenges in the parliament that you've ever experienced? Being in a setting at Queen's Park, being in the chamber at Queen's Park, whereby the system, just the machinery of the, the system, the provincial system, those were not built for our people. That system was not built for First Nations people. And uh, I remember uh, at the beginning, I was really scared when I was sitting in my chair in my desk at Queen's Park. And I didn't know, you know, like I, I'm, you have to remember, I'm a, I'm a shy person. You may not notice it, but I'm a shy person. And uh, I say that because when I, uh, like say for instance, when I first went door to door uh, and uh, saw the cult knocking on doors, when I was knocking on doors in, uh, in Red Lake, and when I was flying into the communities by myself, and it's kind of scary uh, of, uh, to, you know, as a shy person, you, you, you go to a community where you, you, where you don't know people, and that's scary. And uh, when I get up and speak, I, I get very, uh, I got very uh, uncomfortable, I got very shy, uh, and I was nervous. 
and uh, I'm starting to feel comfortable in my place at Queen's Park. And it takes a while, and l learning all the names and some of the, uh, the processes that are in place. Uh, when we work with uh, the speaker in Queen's Park, it's, uh, it's scary sometimes, and, uh, but uh, you have to be, uh, you know, be real. And, uh, and I get a lot of uh, empowerment from visiting communities visiting uh, our people, listening to our people, and this is very, uh, we need to continue to, I need to continue to visit our, our communities and talking to our people like you, yeah. But uh, with, like, the stuff going on like, in different communities, that get people getting evacuated, and um, they're in Ontario, we're very connected with each other, and, um, what happens in a community has ripples effects on every single person in the community. Like, how do you feel about what's going on? Like the evacuations, the forest fires, and the water advisor in that um, Sometimes, uh, you know, I'm traveling alone. I, uh, uh, when, I, when I'm in Queen's Park, sometimes I, I feel as if I'm all alone uh, in, in what I do. And because uh, I don't have access to my to community members at, at Queens Park, uh, but the one thing that really, really got to me was the forest fire or uh, the fires in uh, KI uh, two months ago. I went there two days after the fire, and uh, <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. And then I heard the stories from the parents, the people that uh, seen the fire, and the, the parents that lost their children, and uh, the sisters, the mothers of the, the people that passed away. And I didn't know how to handle that. And then uh, when I was going home by myself on a plane, on a charter, and all of a sudden this thing came over me, just emotion, and I couldn't let it go, and I had to let it go. And I don't tell a, a lot of people about that, but it has that impact on me. And uh, so, you know, it's sometimes hard in that way. And I know even with the, uh, um, you know, when I'm talking to leadership, uh, when there's deaths in the communities, like when you talk to them, you can hear their, that they're mourning, that they're crying. And then sometimes it's hard when you do that. And uh, you need to, uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, have support for me like uh, for people as well to be uh, to be able to do that and uh, it's it's sometimes hard and i i hope to see the uh, the kiwi when evacuees after i leave here later on this evening in school so it's uh, it's a difficult job when you're trying to uh, you know be, be a voice for the people for the north what are the next steps of actions like to help the communities that are in mind at the moment? Um, I think uh, I know uh, recently, I know Pekanchkam, they're sending about 2,000 people to uh, Saskatchewan. And my question is, why Saskatchewan? Why aren't they closer to home? We need, uh, we need people to go to, the evacuees to go to places closer to home. Why not Ontario? Why not Thunder Bay? Why not Kenora? Why not Fort Francis? You know, why? And I think uh, I, I've reached out to several ministers just saying that you know, we need to bring our people closer to home. Because what happens is uh, during evacuations, people, families get separated. And, uh, and it's a very uh, traumatic experience. It's not, a, it's not a, a fun feeling to get evacuated because uh, you lose family connections and you're not able, you're not in the, the, the setting that you used to, so, and I think uh, uh, the next step for, uh, is to try to advocate for communities to be closer to home, to be closer together, uh, and families not to be separated, and, uh, and I know that's one of the things I'm doing with uh, reaching out to the provincial government and say that uh, we need people in our own province to have that so closer to home. We need bigger groups, like um, we have 100, 100 people there, 200 people there, 400 people there. But we need like, you know, uh, like say 700 bigger numbers together rather than just separating them 
all in uh, smaller groups. So I think that's really critical. And, and then uh, communities have to be ready for evacuations no matter what. I think that's very critical. When you said before, and when you were at Queens Park, <coughs> and you felt all alone, how did you find the comfort in your supporters? Um, one of the things I do is I I, uh, I talk to people. Like I I have so many contacts in my phone that I'll, I'll randomly phone them, and uh, I'll try to go to uh, uh, visit communities as well as much as I can. And uh, you know, talk to people, talk to elders, and just uh, like uh, like in Queens Park, I'm I'm unable to speak my language in public, and the people I work with are all English-speaking people, and uh, so my language is very important to me, and uh, and then also just uh, the humor. <laughs> I sometimes I forget the, you know, like sometimes I'll we'll tell I'll tell these jokes uh, to non. To my colleagues that are non-First Nations, they don't find them funny. When when I talk to our own people, they <laughs> come out and laugh. And, 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 and it's those type of things I miss. And it's uh, it's to have uh, as much as connection to First Nations people. And uh, it's it's a really uh, that's how I try and uh, cope with uh, you know I guess being lonely at Queens Park. Ten years ago, would, would you have ever seen yourself where you are right now? Ten years ago, I never had uh, a chance, or even a, an inkling, or even a thought that I would become an MPP. I never thought that, or never mind. You know, 18 months ago, I never even thought that. It's just uh, uh, something that people started asking me, "Would you run?" And I said, "I, I actually I said no once to MPP." And I told him, because I was in a good place working with Ms. Navasky Nation, working with Ovid Mercury, who was a former national chief, and working with uh, Grand Chief Alvin Fiddler at NAN. I thought I was in a good place, but then uh, the more people came to me, uh, and uh, the more I realized that I, you know, that I need to do this, and uh, and it's a very unique opportunity, and uh, you know, uh, and I think uh, it's setting, you know, other people can do it. You, you all can do it. And uh, it's just bringing change to that setting in the provincial system, bringing that change in the way people think at Queen's Park, because they don't know about us. Uh, they don't know who we are. They don't know what we're all about. And it's, my, uh, it's an opportunity for me to teach and educate them on about First Nations people, about uh, who we are and where we come from. And you know, Fort Seven is part of it. And you know, we need to uh, you know what the Crees are about, what what your cultural identity and uh, the things we care about is very different from what they care about. Sometimes they, when they talk about subways, you know, I don't care about subways, but you know, <laughs> perhaps uh, you know, like uh, airports, airplanes, you know, food security, cost of uh, cost of living is very different from in Toronto. So, so those are the stories I try to bring, and I know. Um, I was just talking to uh, the, the officers that work here and the conditions that they have to work under. And uh, things don't need to be the way they are for our people. Sometimes I'll do, uh, I'll say, uh, needless deaths and unnecessary suffering. Sometimes I'll use that language in Queen's Park. But when I say needless deaths, I'll tie stories to it. I know a lot of stories the way. Sometimes uh, the healthcare, the, the justice system, child welfare system, how it treats our people, and, was, and then of course, uh, like say for example, you know, unnecessary suffering. You know, um, it could be you know somebody in healthcare that doesn't have you know I have stories to that too about healthcare, about child welfare system. You know, like those are the, the words, I, and I share stories because I talk to people. People share stories with me, so. I remember them, and I can throw any story about needlessness. I can throw any story about uh, um, you know unnecessary suffering that happens to our people, and those are the type of teachings I need. I, I try and do, and and what happens to our people, uh, we normalize it when when you live it on a daily basis. But when you're in Toronto, it would not be allowed anywhere in Ontario. What happens to our people? 